So just to give you a bit of context first, um, I was a head teacher, I became a head teacher about 10 years ago, um, and it was a time when Michael Gove was in power and Michael Wilshire was uh, head of Ofsted, and there was a massive push for schools to become academies. A, a lot of schools weren't academies yet, particularly primary schools, but there was a massive push for it. Um, in the local authority I work in, they were also moving from a three-tier system where we had um, infant schools, middle schools, and and high schools to a two-tier system. So I'd worked in an infant school in my, my time there and the, the school I took over was um, becoming a, a primary school and having year six for the first time in that year I took over. So I mean I, I went in with lots of enthusiasm and, and thinking this is an opportunity to take a school into a new dawn. Um, I really had no idea about year six sats um, and, and or the impact of them and what they involved and neither did most of the staff to be fair um, and at the end of that year my relationship and the school's relationship with the local authority changed quite dramatically with the result of our first sets of sats we had 14 children in that first cohort and um, so each child was worth quite a lot in terms of um, percentage for the results and we got some of the worst results in the county to be fair the, the local authority uh, lots of schools got bad results that year and actually the, lo the, the local authority had been offsteaded that year and been rated inadequate so they were under inc incredible pressure um, from above from the DfE and the, the agenda there for them was actually to, to convert schools to academies well when we got bad results my relationship with them changed overnight they, they had been quite supportive but quite challenging but in a good way before that and actually it became more of a case of intense scr uh, scrutiny intense pressure and one of the first things they did was um, they uh, put school under a, a, a local authority review which is basically a mock Ofsted now at the time those sorts of things were quite rare and I didn't even know what it was and had to look it up to find out what it involved and I made a very naive mistake because I said to my staff um, because I've been trying to build a culture of collaboration, of risk taking, of creativity. I said to them, this is a brilliant opportunity for, to, for you to take risks and try things out. People are going to come in, they're going to see what you're doing and they can give you some feedback on it and you can learn from that. That's how I'd always operated as a teacher. That's how I wanted my, my staff to operate. I wanted us to, to work with and trusting each other and taking risks. And actually what I should have done was tell tell them to play safe because I didn't really understand the agenda at the time um, and they, they did what I said they, they trusted me and they, they they took risks they tried things out and the local authority um, didn't like what they saw well, I had an advanced schools teacher in maths I had some teachers who I felt were outstanding and the previous head teacher felt were outstanding and they slated them and they called them inadequate and they didn't like what they, they saw at all and they they shattered the morale for the school and right from that point on we were under scrutiny now in in my stress in in under that pressure i felt like i needed to engage and work with the local authority and do what they wanted me to do i felt like i had to try and jump through the hoops they were presenting for me to do the things that they needed me to do partly because i wanted them to go away and leave me alone but that was uh, probably my, my, my first biggest mistake and the lesson I learned that actually at that time I lost sight of my core values and my core vision in, in my effort to do what they wanted me to do I, I wasn't doing the things that I'd set out to do and I'd lost sight of the, the, the culture of the school that I wanted to build and actually the lesson I learned is your core values and your core vision should be the driving force for whatever decisions you make and you need to be brave and say to people, say no to people. If what they're wanting you to do doesn't fit in with what you believe, say no to it. Um, the, the people that employ you, um, your, your your governing body, your 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 head teacher, whoever it is, if you're honest in communicating what your philosophy is and what you believe in, when they take you on, they know what they're getting. So actually, you should feel the confidence to say, I can't do that. I won't do that. I believe in this. I didn't do that. I spent my time jumping through the hoops and I, I lost sight of a lot of things. Um, I did things that were not decisions that I typically believed in, but there were things that I felt the local authority wanted me to do. And it led to me building the, found, the, the, the foundations for my school becoming toxic for laid 
in that time whilst I was jumping through the hoops of the local authority. And it led to my school becoming quite an unhappy place. And that leads me on to the, my next lesson, that actually well-being should always be the priority. Um, if you put people under excessive scrutiny and put them under excessive stress, it's counterproductive. You might well get results short term, um, but longer term, it's, it, it doesn't work. It leads to, to things falling to pieces. Short term, in, in that time when our school was under pressure and I, I was monitoring the staff more and I was, I was holding them to account more rigorously uh, with the, the things I expected them to do and we expected them to, to see, um, we got results. Our, our SATS results dramatically improved. But actually, I also lost members of staff, really good members of staff. They've been working in an environment that wasn't happy, that was stressful. Good experienced members of staff moved out of my school. I don't blame them for that. It wasn't a happy place to work at that point. And that meant the school was in a constant state of flux as well, because we were always having, we were having new staff in all the time. And actually I was a lost experienced staff who understood the school's procedures and systems. And I would say understood the school culture, but actually the, the, the vision of the school culture that I had, I had lost in my, my desperate ploy to try and please the local authority. So, um, we were in a constant state of, of renewal, of trying to get new people in, bedding new people in. So long term, it's not a sustainable model. And actually, if you focus on making your workplace somewhere where well-being matters and staff are happy, um, you might not get the results as quickly, but you will get more sustainable results over the long term because people will be happy to work. They will, they will work harder. They will be more productive. If people are stressed, and unhappy it affects their performance if they are if they're happy they work harder they work better they will learn more and actually the the, the environment that we were working in whilst we were under that that pressure wasn't like that at all um my next lesson was about um being authentic and being vulnerable before i became a head teacher when i was a deputy i was almost fairly laid back. I was quite approachable. I was, I was the person that staff would come to with, with concerns and worries, and I would filter various things to the head teacher you know, that, that, that she, she needed to hear. But I, was a, I, was, I, I felt I was a, a kind, approachable person. Before I became a head, I was worried. Am I too nice to be a head? So for, for some stupid reason, I decided I need to be this different person. I need to be this strong leader, this leader that always appears in control. And I tried to be this person. And actually, that's the person I felt the local authority wanted me to be as well. Well, whilst they were putting me under pressure and scrutinising me, I felt this, this model, this almost Michael Wilshire style leadership was the sort of person I needed to be. It's not who I am. It's not the way I'd worked before. It's the way I tried to work and it didn't help. I tried to appear in control all the time. I tried to appear that everything was fine. It wasn't. I was, I didn't actually know what imposter syndrome was at the time. Um, but having years later learned about it, I thought, yes, that's what I was going through. Most of the time I felt like a complete fraud. I felt like I didn't know what I was talking about. And um, when I sat in, in heads meetings with other heads, I, I felt like I have nothing to, to say here. You, you were all so clever, so knowledgeable. And I don't know what to say. Um, the longer I was out of the classroom, the more I felt like a fraud actually talking to staff about teaching and learning and how they can improve their teaching. Because actually I felt, can I do this anymore? I don't know. And I bottled all these things up and I tried to appear in control all the time. Um, actually, this all affected my mental health and, and it affected my stress levels. I was, I was becoming more depressed. I was becoming more anxious. And actually, that's affecting my performance level as, as a leader as well. And actually, if I'd shared my feelings more honestly and shared my vulnerability more honestly, things would have, would have gone a lot better. I think it actually probably takes more strength to show you're vulnerable than it does to try and appear strong. And that's, that's the lesson I've learned from that. Uh, moving on from that, um, for me, being a head teacher was probably the loneliest time in my life. Um, being a head can be very lonely and it's really important to get a support network. It's 
uh, the leadership is, is, is hard and it can be very stressful at times and you need people around you that can support you. I had a coach and my coach was very good, but I didn't necessarily make the right choice of coach because the, the coach that I had was someone I, I was friends with, I had a personal relationship with. She was the retired head of my children's school. We knew each other before um, and we got on well, but actually when I was working with her, I held things back. I didn't want to appear vulnerable and I, I, I didn't actually talk to her about all the things I probably needed to. Similarly, I had a mentor and a mentor is really useful for a new leader, for a new head. The, the, the mentor I had was one that the local authority had put me in, in touch with and we were very different in our philosophies and our ways of, um, of ways of working. She was very much, she was a very good head and her school was very high performing, but she was a my way or the highway type of head. And actually, if you didn't fit into exactly what she wanted to do and the way she wanted it done, um, you generally left the school fairly quickly. Um, and actually, that doesn't really align with my values. And so I didn't get a great deal of that out of that relationship. Having a mentor is great, but find someone that actually um, will share similar values and similar philosophy to you. So actually, they're, they're going to be more beneficial to you when they're, when they're helping you. And the most crucial bit of advice I would give, the cru most crucial lesson is um, all leaders need to unload to someone. They need to, 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 to release that stress. The person I had un unloaded to was my wife. I would at work, I'd try and appear positive and happy and in control. And then I'd go home and I'd release all that stress. I'd release that through um, uh, being sad, being angry, just being stressed. And actually that's the, my wife, um, she, she was brilliant. She would listen to it all, but it was hard. And it wasn't great for us. It wasn't great for our relationship. I was not a great husband. I was not a great father. At home, I was just, a, I'm not a very happy and not a very nice person to be around but actually if I'd had someone else to talk to someone who's neutral um, I could have unleashed, unleashed those feelings to, to someone in, in, in a safe place and actually then I could have been a little bit more human and a little bit more a, a nicer person in my own home with my family. Um, people who work in, in safeguarding social workers and uh, they have supervision they have people that they can talk to that's a, a neutral person to actually to, so they can release and talk about some of the things that are very hard to deal with in their lives. Uh, leaders should have the same thing. A lot, a lot of leaders talk to their partners. And yes, of course you talk to your partner, but when you're going through stressful times, actually that's a big burden on your family and it might be better to talk to someone else. So that would be the biggest bit of advice I can give it to anyone going into to leadership is to have a good support network, people that you can trust in a safe way. Um, and a lesson that I've kind of reflected on and learned from being a head teacher and finding it incredibly hard and struggling with it is the way you think makes a massive difference. Um, if anyone knows me on, on Twitter, you've probably seen me post this particular um, poster a few times because this really is um, something I try and follow now. When I was at my lowest ebb, as a head teacher and I was I was sinking into depression I was, I was, I was starting to get ill I could see the, the I could see the path I was going on if I carried on the way I was I was going to end up going off with stress and with depression I was full of self-loathing I was full of self-anger and I just was focusing on negative things all the time and that was just making me worse um, whereas actually after I, I, I after I left my headship um, and I, I had space to breathe and space to recover, I've really reflected on the, po the power of positive thinking. And I try consciously now to always say positive things and do positive things, and those things become habits, and actually it makes a huge difference. The, the power of being positive, it, it's very difficult to be positive sometimes, but it has such a power and, and it makes a huge difference. Thinking negative things, things and focusing on negative things also has power, but not a good power. You, 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 can, you can be drawn into a very negative cycle. So that is something that I have learnt through my experiences. Um, now that brings me on to nearly my last point. Um, I left my headship um, because I reflected on 
how it was going. I'd spent years of, of just being unhappy and being stressed, not enjoying my job anymore and, and not liking myself at all. And I, I reflected on what, what did I come into education for? I loved working with children. That's the bit that made me happy. And I, I left my headship to be happy. Status and money are not as important as happiness. It was the best decision I've ever made. It was the best decision for me. I felt guilty for, for leaving my school. I felt like I was abandoning them. I felt um, like I failed as well because I've left a school that I actually hadn't got to where I wanted to go. So there, there is that sense of unfinished business there and, and failure. But for me, it was a, the best decision. And it took me a while, but I gradually came back to being the person that I like, the person who's laid back, who's positive, who's happy, who's a bit silly. I'm, I'm a better husband and I'm a better father now. Um, and every day that I spend in a classroom with children, I get to smile, I get to laugh, they make me feel happy and I get to feel like I'm actually making a difference to their lives. And my experiences have made me a better person. I, I don't regret um, stepping up into headship. Um, I don't regret the experience at all. Uh, I, th I think now I'm a, a stronger person and I'm a better person for those experiences. I'm taking the positives from a, a, a dark time in my life when it, it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. I'm taking the positives from the lessons I've learned from that. So I'm just going to go on. So before I go on to my last slide, I'm just going to apologise because um, I don't really agree with linking education with football, but the person I'm about to show you is someone I I, I truly admire as a human being and as a leader and someone I think we can learn from not for his foot, football knowledge but just for the way he goes about leading oh that's the and, and that is a, a certain Jurgen Klopp um, now as a as a leader he has a really clear vision and that is the driving force of what he does um, there's been many times when people have, have questions what, what he's doing and, 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 and why he's doing them, but he's stuck to his guns of, this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to do. And actually the people that he works with have bought into that and they, they, they followed him for that. He has clear values of teamwork and compassion and he trusts the people around them and he embodied it, embodies it in everything he does. He's a very humble and a very honest person and, and he isn't afraid to share his feelings. He shows his vulnerability and he's got that integrity and people follow him because of the way he portrays himself. And, you know, he's a kind person. He's a passionate person. His team love him and they would run through a wall for him. Everyone that actually works in, in the, the, the institution that he works in, he, he values them. He spends time actually... Um, getting to know all the people from the, the 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 people who work in the canteen to the the ground staff he 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 values everyone's contribution there that is the mark of a true leader he actually well like aziza mentioned in her presentation he looks at the needs of his followers and he makes them better people um if i were to go back into senior leadership again I feel I would probably be a better leader now from the experiences I've had in the past, from, from the lessons I've learned, but I would certainly aspire to be more like this man here and more authentic and more genuine and actually f and stick to my vision and my principles and my values. Right. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you.